Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles. Would you open them to the book of Acts, chapter 13? Acts chapter 13. And this is a Bible study that I've entitled, Your World is Your Mission Field. Your World is Your Mission Field. And here's the thing. When we start talking about missions and missionaries, it's very easy to misunderstand that word. And it almost always gets associated with someone that went to somewhere in the middle of, the, of the middle of nowhere in another country to reach someone that doesn't know the gospel. Now, there is much to be said about world missions, and some of you are going to be a part of world missions. But I titled this message on purpose, Your World, Your World. Your world is the mission field. Or you could say it this way. We are on mission with Jesus. And so your world, your house, your neighborhood, your workplace, everywhere you are is your mission field. And you know, the thing is, is that people think God is uninterested and he's uninvolved in life today. Like he's distant and he doesn't care. He just started the world in motion and said, hey, I'll meet you in heaven. But it's not true. The heart of God is, is missionary minded. God is a missionary God, you can say. He's outreach oriented. A very careful reading of the Bible. I mean, just just beginning in Genesis, right in the beginning with Adam and Eve, as he creates two perfect human beings, as they decide to rebel against him and try to run away from him, what does the Bible declare? God pursues them. And he says, where are you guys? What's happened? What happened to our, where are you? It's not because God didn't have that knowledge. It's because he's a pursuing God. I mean, some of you here today, some of you listening right now, God is pursuing you. And he's asking you, where are you? What have you done with my son, Jesus? Why? Because he loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. Page after page after page reveal the pursuing love of God. I mean, you get to Genesis chapter 12, where God reaches this man by the name of Abram. He was a pagan, unbeliever. He didn't care about the things of God at all. Yet God spoke to him in relationship and said, you know what, Abram, I want you to leave here and I want you to go to a place that I'm going to show you. And why did he do that? Why did he bring up a man from his current circumstance and use him to leave call him to leave and use him in reaching others? Well, the Bible says, so that all the families of the earth would be blessed. And that's the heart of God. God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. Even Jesus models for us a self-sacrificial life to reach the lost. The eternal son of God leaving heaven taking on a human body like yours and mine, speaking a human language, living with the limitations and among the limitations of humanity. Why? So that he might fulfill God's mission through him. You can jot it down in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is why Jesus came. This is the mission of Jesus. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's one of those passages in the Bible that you can go to from time to time, and you can ask yourself, is this what I'm doing? Because if this is not what I'm doing, then I'm not on mission with Jesus. If I don't care about the lost, if I'm not, active, I'm not actively helping brokenhearted people, if I'm not talking, about, talking to people about the freedom that they can have by faith in Jesus, if, I, if I'm not participating in the very things that Jesus came to do, then I'm not really participating in the mission of Jesus. I might be doing a lot of things, and I might be even calling it religious. I might be even saying, because I'm a Christian, but if it doesn't fall in line with these things that Jesus said he came to do, then you're not on the mission that Jesus came with. You're not on mission with Jesus. So we have God the Father. We have God the Holy Spirit. We have Jesus the Son. We, we see that all of them were missions-minded. 
Using that word mission, the idea that we are not just going to complete a mission, but we are on mission, the heart of God to reach the lost. And I dare say that your salvation, you, the fact that you're right with God, that you're born again today, is because somebody was on mission in your life and brought the gospel to you, shared the truth, even if it was difficult, invited you to church, flipped a radio station on. Or I lo always love to hear that when you rent a car, when you start renting cars again, that you change all the presets to Grace FM when you drop it off. Good idea. Or whatever city you're in, just so that when somebody turns it on, even when they're parking it, it's the gospel going forth. You never know how God wants to use that. Well, with that in mind, we come now to Acts chapter 13 to a very pivotal time in the life of the early church. The book of Acts is our history as a church. It's where it all started. And if you were with us many years ago, and we'll be in the book of Acts soon enough again as a church, but if you were with us many years ago when we studied the book of Acts, we gave you the overarching direction of the book of Acts, what, what it's all about, why it even exists, and how can you describe the book of Acts in a sentence? And here was the sentence we gave you. The book of Acts is a demonstration of the Spirit of God using the Word of God through the people of God to reach the lost. That is the book of Acts. The Spirit of God using the Word of God through the people of God to reach, reach the lost. That's the book of Acts. And it starts off right in the beginning in chapter one with the baptism of the Holy Spirit among a very small group of people. About the size of when our church first started. A little bit larger than our first church first started. In our first gathering, when we met on Sunday morning in 1999, there were about 30 people there, 30 adults in our first service. And yet 30 or 3,000, it doesn't matter. God is going to use those whose heart is in tune with them. So you got this small group gathering together and being told to wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We'll get to that in a moment. When you fast forward now to Acts chapter 13, we have a new city and a church that's continuing to grow. The gospel now has left Jerusalem and is headed up into this area of Antioch. Notice with me in verse 1 of chapter 13. Now in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their assistant. This is the beginning of, well, you could say, formalized missions. Although it wasn't truly formalized, it was all by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was leading and speaking, really fulfilling. You know, when, when God says, go reach the world, you're like, well, how can I do that? Well, only by the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, using people of God. That's it. There's no other way. It can't be our elaborate plans. It can't be all of our predictions. It can't be all of our statistics. The only way the world's going to be reached is by the Spirit of God, using the Word of God through the people of God. And that's where they are here in the first century. They're praying. They're gathered together. They're praying. They're ministering to the Lord. And what happens? God speaks. And when God speaks, there's a couple people here that need to go. I want Barnabas and Saul. I've separated them. You need to pray for them and send them off. And that's what they did in verse 3. They fasted, they prayed, and they sent them off. But notice this wasn't human in its origin, because in verse 4 it says they were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit uses men. The Holy Spirit uses women. God is moving through us in the practical realm to affect the spiritual realm. And it's just like Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. You can jot it down. Zechariah 4, 6. Zerubbabel, a man by the name of Zerubbabel, he's up against an absolute human impossibility. And the way that God encourages him is this. He tells Zerubbabel, it's not by your might and it's not by your power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. I mean, even as you're facing what you're facing today, missions and stepping out and serving in this area, doesn't, it's, it's not even high on your list because you've got other things you're dealing with. 
Well, whatever it is you're dealing with, it's not going to be your power and your wisdom. It's not going to be your mathematics. It's not going to be your job hunt and your job searching. It's going to be by the Spirit of God. He's going to take care of you. He's going to lead you and guide you. He's going to help you along the way. You know, you might even be praying for your siblings. You might be praying for your parents. Like, Lord, I just want to see them saved. I want to see them saved. It seems like the time is urgent and the coming of the Lord is at hand. Well, you're not going to be able to save them. You're not going to be able to change them. It's not going to be your power and your might. It's going to be by God's Spirit. And so here we have in the book of Acts, the Spirit of God moving upon the church to accomplish the will of God on the earth today. You know, in building the church, it is a work of God. Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 18, he says, on this rock, Jesus says this, it's his words, on this rock, I will build my church. So every true church, the architect, the author of every real church is Jesus. It's not man. It's not our novelties of how to, you know, just because a crowd gathers together and says they're the church doesn't mean they're the church. It can be a crowd together just to listen to someone for 30 minutes. It doesn't mean they're the church. Every true church has its origin in Jesus Christ. And anytime man wants to take it over and go, we can do it better, you can't do it better. As a matter of fact, not only can you not do it better, you can't do it at all. Every true church is built by Jesus, where the Spirit of God dwells among us. And you know, at the end of the Bible, there's the book of Revelation. And right at the beginning of Revelation, Jesus writes to seven different churches, real churches, seven different churches of all types, stripes, and all kinds of styles. You know, that there's seven different cities, seven different churches, and, and you've got a church that, you know, is backslidden. You have a church that it has a reputation in their life, but they're really not. You have a church, there, there's all sorts. If those of us that study through Revelation, you know, they're all different personalities of the church. But one of the churches is known as the church of Philadelphia. And I don't know anyone that goes to Revelation, all those seven churches, and says, you know, I want to be the lukewarm church, and I want to be the church that doesn't, that has a name, but I'm really dead. Everybody wants to be the Philadelphia church. Everyone, oh, of course, that's who I am. And you know, the churches can apply in Revelation both to the church, but also to us individually. And here's the thing, nobody really wants to admit that they're lukewarm. Nobody really wants to admit that, yeah, they have an appearance that they're right with God, but inside they're not. They're not in the Spirit. They're, they're not walking in the Spirit. They're just religious. Oh, but Ed, you don't understand. I've been in the church all my life. And you've probably been fake and religious your whole life. And the way to get out of it is just to admit it, to repent before God. And say, I don't want to be like this anymore. I want to tap into the Spirit of God. I want to be used by God. I want to make a difference for the kingdom. I want to make an eternal difference. And so nobody really wants to be, and I know for us, as I pray over our church, I don't want to be the church in Sardis. The church in the city of Sardis, Jesus said this to them, I know your works, that you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. I don't want that to be our church. You have a name, you have a reputation, people talk about it, but you, everybody thinks you're alive, but in reality, you have no spirit among you. No, we don't want to be that. We don't want to be the church of Laodicea. Here's what Jesus said to the church in Laodicea. He said, I know your works. And that's the second time he said that, right? Because you can have a gathering. You can have a lot of activity. You can do a lot of things. A lot of works. I know your works. Some of them are very good, very noble, very moral. I know your works. But that you're neither cold nor hot, Jesus said. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I'm rich, I've become wealthy, I have need of nothing. But you do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's some pretty heavy stuff. It's like, oh, I'm doing fine, I've been walking with the Lord for a long time, I can... No, 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 from Jesus' estimation, you're empty. You're empty, we don't want that. You know, as we gather together, pastors and our staff, we regularly pray for God to pour out His Spirit on our church. But in a general way, we also pray that today that the church would experience revival and renewal like never before. This has been such a time of division and difficulty, and the church just gets caught up in it. They get caught up in things that, man, they're going to pass in a couple years, and then what? You're going to look back on a couple years and go, I just wasted them. 
I got involved in stuff I was like, like we need to be refreshed. We need to be renewed and we need to have revival among us. And revival means that you were once alive and then it just swept away and God breathes new life into us, into our church, this little fellowship, that we would be renewed and refreshed so that we don't become something that's not the church, even though we keep calling ourselves church. We even this year or a few years ago added the name, the word church to our name so that people could know this is a church. This little building on the corner, it's a church. Yes, we gather together. We are the church. Okay, well then we need to be the church. Live it out, the power of God in our lives. And one way you can do that is by engaging in the spirit of God in your prayer life and then obey him when he separates you unto the ministry. The early church reached the world through prayer, fasting, and preaching. They traveled lightly and they were utterly dependent upon the spirit of God. And you know, God just allows things into our lives so that we would learn to be dependent upon him. That we wouldn't be dependent upon the things that we've been leaning on our entire life. You know, when you look to someone or something other than God, they become an idol in your life. I know idolatry kind of gets relegated to little statues and stuff, but no, idolatry is much deeper than that. Idolatry speaks to dependence and satisfaction and contentment that you get from someone or something else. And so what does God do? He allows things to go through the country. He allows things to go through the world. He allows things to go through the government to shake the church and then to reveal to you, yeah, you've been leaning on that, haven't you? You've been dependent upon that, haven't you? And some people even respond. Listen, some people even respond to trials to try to guard and protect their idols instead of letting them go and say, no, Lord, I get you. You got my attention. I want to look to you. I trust you. And the heart of God in getting the gospel out is found for us. If you come back to Acts chapter 1, right here in Acts chapter 1, this is the blueprint for God, 2,200 years old, and it hasn't changed. This is the blueprint for our church. This is the blueprint for your life here in Acts chapter 1. Pick up in verse 4, would you? Acts chapter 1. This is the plan of God. You wonder how he wants to reach the world? and you wonder what your role is, it's right here. Pick up with me in verse four. He says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That's an interesting it's an interesting thing. In Matthew 28, Jesus told them to go. But before they go, he tells them, I want you to wait. Now, anyone that has ever waited on God for anything for any length of time knows this is a difficult command. It makes you nervous. And it makes you like, like, like you're, you're restless when you hear, no, God says, I want you to wait. And automatically, what happens? You start asking all kinds of questions. You say, well, how long am I going to wait? What am I waiting for? How will I know what happens when it does? You know, you got all these questions. Even these guys, notice they came with questions in verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? This word to wait raises all sorts of questions, but the word is to wait. And, and to wait for God. Well, how long? Will, well, you'll know. You'll know how long. I, I don't know how long, but you'll know how long. You know, in this case, it said not many days, but, but they don't know how many days that is. You know, days can equal weeks. Days can equal months. Days can equal years. Days can equal lifetimes. But the key is this. If God has given you the command to wait, I want to remind you of something very important. You're not waiting for something. You're waiting on someone. Don't miss that. You're waiting on, you are trusting. The command to wait is also a command to trust God with the circumstance, with the situation. And Jesus in Acts chapter 1, he's going to ascend into heaven and they're not going to have him anymore. And this waiting would be critical for them. This baptism of the Holy, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit would be absolutely critical for them. In verse 7 it says, it's not for you, Jesus answered, to know the times or the seasons which the Father's put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, 
and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. This is the plan of God. You're going to receive power. If you already have that circled in your Bible, if not, circle the word power and right next to it, dunamos. Dunamos. It has the idea in the English of the dynamic, unexplainable power of God. It is not what you are capable of. It is beyond your capability. Yet that power of God is going to come on you, upon you, going to envelop you. And immediately you will be witness. You will be a witness. You will witness to the power of God in your life. And then he says, you're going to be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Well, in chapter 5 of the book of Acts, we read that they filled Jerusalem, they filled all Jerusalem with the gospel, but they didn't take the next step. So they followed through with God in, in cooperating with the mission of God. They filled all Jerusalem with the gospel, but they didn't take the next step. You know what, required, you know what was required in their life to get them out of Jerusalem? Persecution. Hey, difficulties will move you. They will stir you. God said, I want you in Jerusalem. Jesus said, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. But they stayed in Jerusalem. Why? Because comfort and ease is something that we value in our culture. We like to be comfortable. We like things easy. We don't like challenges. That's why, that's why the alcoholism, alcoholism rate is so high. It's one of the reasons why I turn to it in my life. It's just like, man, I just don't want to deal with reality. I don't want to deal with difficulty. I don't want to deal with pain. And I live my life under the influence most of my teenage life into my 20s. It was only the power of God that delivered me and began to show me that there's plan and purpose for my life in particular. It was somebody coming to me that was on mission with Jesus telling me, you know what, Ed, you're super messed up. And I'm like, dude, I already know that. But what he told me is, you don't have to be. God has a plan for you. You, you need to come back to the God who loves you, created you. And this life that you're living is so, is, is so painful. You know it's painful. And what my buddy didn't know is he didn't know just how painful it was. He had no clue of the life that I was living. He had no idea. He knew it was bad, but he didn't know how bad it was. But God did. And sometimes God just brings persecution to you to say, look, you guys have been comfortable too long. It's been too long. And so he shakes things up, and that's what they did. What happened? The persecution came, and they took off. And they took off with the gospel. They took off with the truth. And they went into, as it says here, Judea and Samaria. Those of you that look at the back of your Bibles, you know there's a map there. You can see the regions around Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Judea would not be a big deal uh, for the believers, the Jewish believers of the first century. They would say, yes, we'll go to Judea. But Samaria, Samaria was a challenge to them, whether it was outward or inward. Because remember, Samaritans were not completely Jewish. And because of that, they were treated with great prejudice. They, they were treated with great carelessness. Even so much so that in the travels of Jewish men and women, they would avoid Samaria because they believed they were less than the value that God placed upon them. And God's saying very early on, Jesus is saying very early on in the church, I want you to know something, the gospel's for everybody. Even if you've written them off, listen, if you, even if you've written yourself off today, the good news of the gospel is for you. It's for you, for God to do a work in your life. And so they end up going to Judea, Samaria, and then finally to the end of the earth. It's all included. God wants us to participate in all of it. And so if you're taking notes, let me just take this verse and unpack it a little bit so we understand what's happening. And there's two ways to view Acts chapter 1, verse 8. There is on a personal level, and I'll address that, how do we apply this personally in our lives? And then there's a church level. How do we apply this as the church? How do we apply this as our church, just our little church? So number one, notice that they are to take the gospel to Jerusalem. Here's your personal application. Your Jerusalem is your home. You are to be faithful with the gospel in your house. You are to live out the truths of God in your life at home, in the room that you rent, the apartment you live in, the condo, the house, the neighborhood, the duplex, the triplex, wherever you are, the gospel starts at home. You cannot be something at home and then something different when you leave home. It doesn't work like that. 
There's a Bible word for that. It's called hypocrisy. It starts at home. If you're married, it starts with your spouse. If you have kids, it starts with your kids. If you, have, you live with your grandparents, your parents, it starts with your family. It starts at home. The gospel has to be lived out at home. There's no other option. Now, you can choose not to live it out at home and live it out somewhere else, but that's not really living it out. It starts at home. You got to let the power of the gospel work at home. For us as a church, well, Jerusalem equates to Aurora. That's where our church is. We have a responsibility to reach Aurora, to love Aurora, to serve Aurora. And I know there are different boundaries that they draw every once in a while and they change. Those. It, it doesn't matter what the boundaries are. Aurora is our home and we are going to reach Aurora. This is our heart. This is where God planted us. This is where we are. And we need to be faithful to our city first and foremost. That's why God put us here. Secondly, Judea, Samaria. And you'll notice Judea, Samaria is just a little bit broader. So what does that look like on a personal level? Here, the gospel is to go through your life, the life-changing word of God through your life to Judea, Samaria. So from your home, then it extends to your family, your family. So that could be your mom and dad, that could be your in-laws, that could be grandma and grandpa, that could be cousins, aunts, uncles, your family. It can also extend to work. Those are your coworkers, the, your boss. Maybe you're a boss, so your employees. And it extends to your neighborhood. The person that lives across the street from you or the one that lives behind you. You have a Judea Samaria where from the home base, of home, from home base, the gospel goes out and flourishes in your surrounding area. That's your responsibility. For us as a church, Judea Samaria would equate to the Denver metro area. It would equate to Lakewood and Golden go down to Canyon City or up into Fort Collins, all throughout Colorado and the United States of America. God has given us a mandate to take the gospel to our country, to people, to our city, to our, to our community. You know, it's always funny. I've been here all these years and I still don't know where all the cities are. I always trip out when somebody calls Calvary Live and then the city name comes up. I'm always curious. I go, before we even get to the question, I go, oh, so-and-so from such and such. Where is that? And then they start to describe it. Well, you know, if you go to the rock and you turn left and you take to the tree and when you get to the five cows, that's where we are. Praise God. Because wherever they are on the plains or up in the mountains, they're important to God. And it doesn't matter where they live. Even if you have to follow trees and rocks to find them, you'll find them. And then it says to the uttermost parts of the earth. And that means what it means. That God wants you to individually participate in global missions. Isn't that awesome? Global missions. Some of you listening to me right now are the future missionaries where we will pack your bags, have you on the stage, lay hands on you, and say goodbye to you as you launch off on God's will for your life. And I know, especially those of you that just said right now, I'll never do that. Go ahead and say never a little bit louder to God. Say it louder so I'll never do that. Maybe, maybe not. But what I intend for you to do today is be open to obey God's word. You can go as a missionary. You can go as a sender. You can go in these virtual trips that we have but it is God's mandate. And for us as a church, we send missionaries around the world. And if we're not sending them because we haven't for a little while, then we're going to find them and support them. And we're going to encourage them. And we're going to call them. And we're going to send short-term teams to them. And even recently in the last few years, Pastor JJ and I and one of our board members will go travel to them personally, check in on their marriage. No team will just show up, take them out to dinner, encourage them, love on them for a couple days, and then take off because we love our missionaries that much that we're going to invest our lives in their lives. If you read the rest of Acts 13, you see that as they were going, they kept hitting resistance. They hit liars and fakes. And that's all part of the ministry. It's just going to be hard. I mean, we try to explain it. And we use the word hard. We learn our, use our language. But, but we don't know how hard it's going to be for you. It's just going to be hard to obey God. Some of you decide today, I'm going to live out the gospel in my house. It's going to be hard. And some of you, I'm going to live out the gospel to my neighbor. It's going to be hard. And, and I'm going to serve here in Aurora when I'm shopping. And, and I'm just going to drive to another city in some part of, the, of Colorado and just go to a restaurant there and minister to the waiter and waiter. It's going to be hard. But you know what? It's going to be worth it to obey God. And it won't be in your own strength. It'll be the power of the Holy Spirit. God is just wanting you to step up and step out to let the Lord use you 
God has given us a mandate. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And we want to stir you up into love and good works. I, I know you're hesitant. I know it's hard. I know for many years, that's how I approached this topic. As a believer, as a pastor, as a pastor of this very church, the early years of this church, I was so encouraged and so excited about sending, sending, sending. And that's what I did. That was my commitment. Send missionaries, short term, send, 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 send. And then God brought a brother into our church, Pastor Dave Gordon. He was our missions pastor for many years. Dave and his wife Irina right now are pastors at Calvary Chapel in Bangkok because they left here as missionaries. But before they left here, he was serving alongside of me. And anyone that knows Pastor Dave, his energy level on a scale of one to 10 is a hundred. And he loves missions. He's like JJ. He loves missions. He loves to serve. He loves to motivate. He loves to train. Man, it's so good to have those men in our church. So Dave would come every once in a while and go, Ed, you got to go. You got to go with us. You got to go. And it's like, bro, I don't want to go. I got too much going on. I got this church is growing. I got too much. You go. And then he would say at the end, okay, Ed, I'll go. And he'd take a team out on the field. Then he'd come back. He goes, oh, Ed, you should have been there. You should have been there. I'm like, glad. I'm glad you were there, Dave. I'm glad. Why don't we have you and share a testimony? And I'll be excited. Why? Because even to this day, I'm not a big fan of traveling. Even though you, some of you go, well, Ed, you travel quite a bit. I know, out of obedience. But it's not something that I really like high on my list because, you know, it's uncomfortable. And where we're staying, we might be sleeping on the floor and, and there might be scorpions and there might be, uh, you know, man. And the food, the food, the food. It's very challenging for me. Anyone that even will go to Israel with us, which is a pretty comfortable trip, will watch me eat trail mix the whole trip. It's just food. It's just, and, and, and then with Dave over here, you know, and, and really it's just me being wanting to be comfortable and stay comfortable. You got Dave over here and then the Lord dropped another guy into my life from Calvary Chapel down uh, in Colorado Springs, Calvary Worship Center. And he was a missions mobilizing guy and God sent him up here. So I got Dave in this year telling me, got to go, got to go. And now I got this new guy saying, Ed, it would just be so good for you. And he took more of a low key approach. He said, it would be so good for you. You should come with me. I'll help you on your first trip. I will train you. I will help you. And, and, and he just wore me down and he says, okay, we're going to go to Egypt. Egypt. <laughs> Why not just jump right in, Ed? And that's what we did. My first major trip in missions was to Egypt. Now, I did a lot of little smaller things, but the big one was Egypt. I went on a small team to Egypt where we went into the poorest of the poor neighborhoods of Cairo, and we ministered the gospel to a very small church in the midst of great persecution, surrounded by people that hated them and wanted them dead. They weren't just poor, they were poorer than poor. But we gathered together and we worshiped together. Because you know what? God wanted me to go to Egypt to learn a lot about the church outside of Aurora. He wanted me to learn that there are believers all around the world speaking all sorts of languages that love Jesus. He wanted me to sit in a room and listen to a group of people singing their hearts out to Jesus in Arabic. It was so beautiful. He wanted me, it wasn't really about the trip or about getting on a plane or being uncomfortable. You know, he wanted me in Egypt to meet Pastor Hisham. He wanted me to learn what ministry looked like in a very oppressed poor place. He wanted us, and we brought a lot of things to them. We supported them finally. We did a lot, but that really wasn't the focus of the trip as everyone could share their testimony. God wanted me to learn how to die to myself. He wanted me to see he's alive on the earth. It's not just the U.S. that God is doing a great work and people need encouragement other, uh, and all over the world. He, he wanted me to sit at someone's table and eat their food, even though their food was hard to eat. <laughs> There's a dish in Cairo, it's a big deal, they make it in a big batch. It's a batch, I forget what they call it, molokai, I think, or something like that. It was a soup, but I have a name for it. It was called, I called it snot soup, <laughs> because that was the consistency of it. And it didn't taste very good either. And so you could pick it up and it's run, and it would run down your throat and get stuck in your throat. And, and I didn't like it. But the culture, in honoring someone inside their culture, you eat everything that they serve you, and they hover over you to keep your bowl full. <laughs> and I think on one of the trips, because we went back many times, I don't think it was the first one, but on one of the trips, I convinced Pastor Avan to take my soup. 
And I, I don't know what he did with it, but it wasn't my problem once I gave it to him. <laughs> he wanted me to understand and sit across the table that a delicacy in Cairo was a fully cooked with everything but the feathers pigeon. Pigeon with the eyes looking at you from the... And we're sitting at a restaurant. We took Pastor Hisham to a nice restaurant there. And of all the things that he ordered, he ordered pigeon. And we talked to him about it. And he says, well, this is not something I can get very often. And I told him, dude, that's something I don't want very often. (laughs) And we had a great time together. I say all this to say that that trip and the surrounding people launched me off to a desire not only to send, but also to go, to be faithful. You know, we weren't just writing checks to missionaries, although Marie and I still do that to this day. It's not either or, but it's both. And God wants you to engage. He wants you to be a part of. He wants you to support and encourage and be a part of all that he's doing on the earth today. And church, we settle for stuff that is so insignificant. We settle for our lives that don't mean anything. And it takes all of our time and all of our attention when the church can use our encouragement all around the world. And so in these go teams, I want to encourage you when we announce them, pray over them, be a part of them and go downstairs, pick up some prayer cards, get involved in the stuff we're already doing. When you hear like, it'll just blow your mind of what God wants to do in your life. Even as you just start praying for someone outside of this culture, outside of this society here in the U S God is doing a great thing. And he wants us to be a part of it in these last days these last days. Because you look at it, you go, man, these days are crazy. They're out of control, man. The perilous times have come. They're not just going to come. They're here. But then what's our responsibility? Just to sit around and try to protect it all and fight it all and shake a fist? No. It's time to just go right under the radar and serve the Lord. Reach as many people as we can and just go for it. And we'll just watch. God will provide. He'll supply. He'll open doors. And then we'll be ready. You'll be ready. You get involved in one of these virtual type trips. You you will be ready when the door opens and we start hopping on planes again. And we start showing up. And we start taking small support teams. And we start doing the ministry again. It's going to be glorious and it's going to be wonderful. But it starts with embracing the Word of God. And knowing it's the Spirit of God working through the Word of God in the people of God to reach the lost. Amen? So Father, I know that uh, we get excited about these things. I mean, I thank you for Dave and Pastor Dave, and I thank you for a brother that you brought into my life that just would not leave me alone about missions and my role as a pastor and as a brother and as a believer to step out and just stop worrying about what I'm comfortable with or whatever and just do it. And I'm grateful for them, God. I'm grateful um, that you would open the door Uh, and allow us to be a part of your eternal work. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. It's a privilege, God, that some in our church haven't taken advantage of yet. And it may not be world missions. It might be Judea, Samaria. It might be the local uh, alternatives pregnancy center. It, It might be helping the homeless. It might be a thousand that the neat thing is it's so you can, there's so much. It can be so creative on how to be used. So God, pour out your spirit as we come to you at the table. We come now to the common table, communion, where we remember your blood washed away our sins. We remember your broken body together as one. There's no division in the real body of Christ. We create all kinds of division among ourselves, but in your spirit, there is no division. And so we're reminded of that at the table that we can lay aside even our personal differences and come together in unity, remembering your body and your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223 or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.